proceeds in the Senate. <coughs> These three uh, gentlemen are um, probably the smartest guys I know. Uh, and I've, you know, been, I've, uh, <coughs> I've been the executive director of the center for about 14 months. And, uh, and I met Danny uh, in Sheehan uh, uh, almost a, a, a year ago now. And, and when I first met him, I had to stop him upon every other sentence and say, well, what's that mean? What's that mean? And to, to, he's, uh, Danny Sheehan uh, was one of the uh, lawyers that worked with Ethel Bailey on the Watergate case. Yeah, you may know him as uh, also as the, the uh, chief prosecutor of Three Mile Island, and um, as well as uh, Karen Silkwood um, and the Iran-Contra hearings. Uh, really has, has been on the cutting edge of, um, of uh, both legal work, uh, create, creating some of the freedoms that we have in our society, <laughs> demonstrating the, uh, the effectiveness of, of, of the, the Constitution and, and the country that we have, and has, is, is really also on the cutting edge and some, on, on, on the le leadership thinking that in, in transformation, and we'll be talking about that tonight. John Mack. As you know, a Pulitzer Prize winning author, he's the founder of the Center for Psychology and Social Change. He's also the founder of the, um, of the uh, Department of Psychiatry uh, at Cambridge Hospital, which is Harvard University's teaching uh, uh, school, and is also uh, a, a great friend and one of the, one of the most uh, uh, wonderful people I know. He's uh, the uh, author of the uh, Passport to the Cosmos, an abduction, as well as Prince of Disorder, by which he won a Pulitzer Prize. An extraordinary human being, and I'm, I'm actually very proud of have made my friendship with him over the past like, 14 months. Joe Furmage, uh, as you, as you uh, know, was the uh, founder of uh, USA Net, which uh, grew to be a uh, multi-billion dollar company. Uh, he is now the, um, the, the founder of uh, Many One, uh, which is a I think a transformative uh, internet um, software uh, interface, a brand new interface to the to the internet that I think is really extraordinary. And he's actually asked the Senate to be the the uh, the steward of uh, consciousness on that on that uh, on, on, coaster. Uh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Coaster. Coaster. Uh, of consciousness. There are many organizations on 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 that on that uh, on many one. Um, he is also uh, many one has been uh, is uh, is was uh, developed uh, with uh, the assistance of um, I'm sorry of uh, Carl Sagan's Carl uh, Sagan. widow. We can't say his name. No, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I think I'm a little nervous, so I just got lost there with the sense. Okay. Uh, again, one, uh, really an extraordinary person. You know, my background was uh, you know I was a manufacturing guy. I worked for Digital Equipment Corporation. For about 12 years, and I was a you know a kind of a closet seeker. And I'll tell you more about that at, at, at the end of this uh, piece. But so it was an extraordinary opportunity for me to come to the center, bring kind of management skills uh, here, and the people I've met have been have been very enriching for my life. So uh, without further ado, I, I, I welcome these three speakers, please. Sit or stand up. I guess we should stand up, huh? When we speak, yeah. Okay. Um, what we're going to do this evening? Uh, we're not going to give like three of us give. Sp no, but this is uh, this is to record for the video. But to actually, hear, so you can hear. We should probably use this one, right? Okay, that's better, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the form of this evening is uh, to create a conversation here. The three of us are only going to make quite brief opening statements. There will be op other opportunities for us to say what we have to say. But uh, the, the idea is to not to have like set speeches or discussion, or not, you know, back and forth, but to really develop a dialogue among us uh, here. Uh, I want to start. Uh, this is a um, from the um, 
Chief, the central article in the New York Times Week in Review this past Sunday, the article is titled, Unthinkable, Eyeball to Eyeball and Blinking in Denial. And uh, it's about the psychological madness that is involved in the Indian-Pakistani confrontation. I'll just read you one quote. This is from General Begg, the former Pakistani army chief. Look, he said, I don't know what you're worried about. You can die crossing the street, hit by a car, or you could die in a nuclear war. You've got to die someday anyway. <laughs> uh, that kind of captures what inspired us to create the center uh, 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 20 years ago, that kind of thinking that was going on. Because it's not dissimilar to what went on uh, at the, among the, some of the intellectuals that were involved in the uh, confrontation between the Soviet Union and the United States. And there, uh, a number of us educators, psychologists, uh, philosophers came together because we thought there, there was something about us as human beings that we needed to look into deeply to understand that kind of denial, that kind of uh, willingness really to destroy on such a vast scale in the service uh, of somebody's difference with somebody else or a group's difference with a, another group. Now, that went on for quite a number of years and we had uh, books, articles on the sources of the nuclear arms race, uh, conferences that brought together people from different disciplines to look at it, uh, all aspects of the human dimension of a nuclear uh, confrontation. Uh, when the clock of the atomic scientist bulletin went over toward like from two minutes to midnight to 12 <laughs> minutes to midnight, the funding for that among various organizations changed so the nuclear fear kind of died down. Fear is often what drives foundations. And uh, the fear is now increasing, again, in the nuclear area. Um, but the center has made some shifts. I mean, we're so interested in that subject and are in network with a number of people in leadership positions around uh, the, uh, the threat of nuclear war. But we moved into other dimensions of individual and collective destructiveness. What are the sources of that, which is what we're fundamentally uh, about. And about 12 or 13 years ago, um, uh, I got into this mad business, people, many people thought, of uh, working with people who had encounters with beings from we know not where, the so-called abduction phenomenon. And uh, neither I nor anybody on the, connected with the center practically, with a few exceptions, understood what that had to do with social transformation. You know, aliens are here, they're not here. You know, what, what is that? You know, are they, they good for us? They're bad for us? Where do they come from? Okay, but trans social transformation wasn't that. Well, little by little, and, and particularly in the last few years, I begin to see that it does have to do with social transformation. It's not about UFOs. Well, it is about UFOs, but not just about UFOs. It's about who we are. Are we in relationship beyond ourselves uh, at a cosmic level? Do we connect in the universe beyond the arrogance that treats the planet as if it belongs to us, as reflected in that statement? And I went through a, a lot of struggle with uh, Harvard, as some of you may know. Danny was tremendously helpful in that. He didn't mention my case, of course. I guess that was my, not on my <laughs> uh, uh, And uh, the out of that Harvard experience, there was a multidisciplinary conference in 1999. They, they said, "Well, why don't you get a lot of people together?" So we brought together people from 10 different fields, uh, anthropology, uh, physics, astrophysics, um, history of science, psychology, psychiatry, philosophy, theology, to look at this experience, the UFO abduction experience, and other anomalies related to it. And what we came to realize is that we lack what might be called a science of human experience. In other words, there is not a rigorous understanding 
of what kinds of methodology, what kinds of approaches are needed to look at the whole range of human experiences which have to do with encounters with other dimensions, beings in another dimension, or uh, with when people have uh, an opening to the divine in, through, say, a near-death experience or experience past lives. How do we study that? And what happens in science uh, often is, if you can't prove it by the methods of material science, it doesn't exist. So a vast part of the human being in the world is simply not open to the scientific or the knowledge conversation. So in recent years, the center has become very involved with looking at anomalous human experiences and what do they have in common and what do they have to do with our original purpose of social transformation. Well, what we're finding is, through a number of the projects we'll be talking about, is that they have to do, each of them, with identity, who we are. And the in UFO encounter, uh, is the rapid one in a way, I and mean, there are others, you know, LSD, but we can't go around spraying LSD every place. So, uh, so it is one of the uh, most powerful uh, transformational experiences for the people that have those encounters, but it's not the only way. There are many, many routes to transformation, and uh, this has been one of them, and we've begun to look at what happens to those individuals? For example, when they, uh, they become deeply involved, for example, in caring for the earth after they, if you work through the terror of those experiences, or they become appalled at how we relate to one another, or they become open spiritually. There, again, there are many ways that people uh, open, but this is a very powerful way, and it's a, uh, something that is in a way a conversation in this culture which is so technologically focused, although the, the phenomenon occurs throughout cultures. So that opening of identity, that, that uh, expansion of consciousness, that awakening that happens among people who uh, undergo these shattering experiences, that is of tremendous importance, we think, for what happens to us as a species. In other words, it, it creates a whole different notion of who we are. It allows us to begin to see that we are not simply members of a single ethnic group or uh, a nation, but we are interconnected beyond simply the group that we feel ourselves to be identified with. So the center's very much involved now in looking at the relationship of profound, what gets called anomalous experiences, but are really part of what it is to be human what that has to do with collective change. And so I think we'll be hearing more about that from a number of people tonight, and I'll have more to say about that. But um, it's that relationship of the individual to the collective that we're exploring and trying to bring about. And the center is kind of a hub of communication and expression and passing on of information around those questions, so, uh, along with many other organizations uh, that uh, like uh, the ones you've been hearing about from uh, people here today. And again, I want to also thank uh, Henry and Virgilia Dakin and uh, Sergio, who always kind of somehow is there to help whenever we come to San Francisco, and, and I just very much appreciate what you do, uh, Sergio. Uh, so um, I don't know which one of you is next. Uh, but Danny, you want to go? Probably most of you here know who know about me, associate me with the Christic Institute, probably, and the litigations that we did in Karen Silkwood case in Three Mile Island, the, the others that Don had mentioned, the Ron Contra case. I spent 25 years uh, basically litigating uh, a number of really important issues from the Pentagon Papers case to the Watergate burglary to the Iran-Contra case, trying to convince myself that all that was really needed was to, to perform some kind of minor adjustments in the legal political system that we have operating here, and that uh, things would work out all right. 
Uh, I remember when, like when I started when I was only four years old, I remember sitting in my, my lawn up in northern New York when the, first, when the first time I saw stars coming out, being out at night. And I looked out into the stars and saw these suns, these solar systems, out in our galaxy and realized that it was virtually certain that there were planets circling some of these stars and that there were other entire civilizations out there. And from that point on, it always seemed to me to be kind of strange how our human family acted, as if that weren't true. That we would draw circles and lines around our territory and we would fight with each other and uh, shoot each other over boundaries and not share the resources of the world and contaminate our, our environment. So, uh, but I, I thought that the best way to prob probably address this particular set of pro policy problems was to establish contact with extraterrestrial civilizations. And so, coming up out of high school, I applied to go to the Air Force Academy to become an astronaut. And when I wasn't given the nomination for the uh, Air Force Academy, I was completely flabbergasted that the legal system wasn't working properly because they gave the appointment to the son of the mayor of Glens Falls, this other <laughs> town. I said, oh, this must be an anomaly. And so, what I should do is become a lawyer and I can work for a short period of time, uh, getting the system to work correctly again, and then I, can get, then I can get back to this issue of establishing contact with extraterrestrial And so, so that went on for 25 years. Uh, from the, let's say, from the, uh, from the pet, uh, publication of the Pentagon Papers, to the Watergate burglary, to the other major cases. And at the, at the end of the Iran-Contra case, when it became perfectly obvious that there was a, a group of our human family that were consciously organized together to try to manipulate po politics and to get access to the resources of the world and to uh, abuse other people in our constitution and our government, and that they, in fact, had some major sway in our own government. And that they weren't really, it wasn't just that the, that the uh, song was being sung out of tune. They were singing a completely different song. You see that girl in the purple dress? I discovered. And so I shifted from trying to just amend the, the legal system in minor ways or share additional information with the authorities on the assumption that they would therefore then go ahead and do the right thing into working with the Gorbachev Foundation and the State of the World Forum to attempt to work on identifying an entire new paradigm, some kind of method by which we could lift up our human family to a higher level of consciousness. And it was clear that there are a number of issues that are sailing to this task, one of which is... You're supposed to lean toward me because... No? I was trying to say that I'm picking up your whispers. Oh, or you pick up the whispers. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I mean, we should shut up. Oh, I should shut up. Okay. So, so the, bo the, bottom, the bottom line is, is that, that, uh, that in, in working on this effort to figure out how we can elevate our collective human consciousness to a, di a different level of consciousness that can appreciate the fact that, that there are other extraterrestrial civilizations, that there is no reason for us to have to engage in the kind of conduct that we engage in here on our planet that is self-destructive is, is a, a task that, like Georgie, Georgie Zimmer and I spend lots and lots of time talking about this, and John and I spend time talking about this, and Joe and I have spent time talking about this, and what we want to do is we want to instigate a set of conversations among our generation to try to figure out how we can get about helping to raise the consciousness of our people. One of these ways is to deal with the issue of extraterrestrial intelligence. Another one of the ways is to deal with the issue of mystical experience. Another one of the ways is to engage in philosophical discussions 
of how we can better integrate our energy of self-interest and the larger interest. How we can balance this to maintain the kind of energy that is generated by self-interest, but to include the interests of the larger community. Now, these are all very important aspects of the task that we're all engaged in here. And when, when John told me that at the Center for Psychology and Social Change, one of the major things they were trying to do is figure out how to engage in the kind of studies and discussions about this issue of consciousness in the context, as well as others, of the issue of extraterrestrial intelligence, I said, look, this is a task that is not only very well worth doing, but it's a task that's indispensable to our generation. If we're going to fulfill the promises that we have made to each other over these past 30 years, now is the time for us to move. Now is the time for us to come to some sense of understanding of what we believe these, these phenomena to be, the issue of extraterrestrial intelligence, the issue of, of uh, preternormal experiences, uh, ESP, uh, psychic phenomenon, the, the intuitive uh, mystical dimension, and how that relates to philosophy and politics in our world. This is a discussion I have with Bill Stranger all the time about how does, how does this issue of uh, mystical consciousness relate to social political forms. So there's a group of us all here that have been engaged in this conversation for some time. What we wanted to do tonight was to, to bring a few of us together who have engaged in this for a long time and see if we can move this conversation forward in the context of being of some assistance and showing how the Center for, Science, for, for Psychology and Social Change want to work so they can get your support in, in Boston to do this. That's just an introduction so you know what we're, we're doing here tonight. so impressed to hear the uh, 10 second uh, snapshots of, of so many wonderful people. Uh, I was playing with Legos while these gentlemen were uh, working on these types of things, um, so I'm a relative newcomer to, to these questions, but uh, I've certainly thrown as much uh, uh, as I can into them uh, in the last five years. I've spent my whole life, uh, uh, once I grew up, uh, in, in the professional disciplines of science and technology, and uh, thus gained an appreciation of at least one person's view of, of what is known and what isn't known, and uh, came to an understanding in 1998, uh, sort of pinnacle of my economic success, that a lot less was known about certain basic questions than uh, is generally believed. Uh, and it's, it, it was a cusp of uh, uh, social change in, in my, my life, for sure. Uh, and it threw me off in a whole new set of directions, so the most, of, I think, uh, uh, interesting of which have to do with the, the subjects that these gentlemen have touched upon. Uh, over the past three years, I've been focused on building some information technology that uh, may play some useful role in, uh, in showing what technology could do, perhaps, to help uplift human consciousness in a scalable way. Um, Owen mentioned uh, something close to my heart. Figuring out how to actually leverage these ideas to, to make real change uh, happen more rapidly than it otherwise would. Um, and I've also been very focused in, in studies of physics and, and uh, uh, questions that relate to uh, what the long-term trajectory of humanity may be. Um, and in that regard, uh, I, I've been privileged to meet a, a, just a, a, an incredible uh, spectrum of brilliant minds at the front end of uh, tomorrow's science and uh, technology. And some of those folks are here today, Bernie and others. Excuse me. Um, I, 
was incredibly honored to be invited by John Mack to join the board uh, of the center a couple of years ago and make a donation to the group. Um, and I'll tell you why. Uh, you hear all the time from me and a lot of other people uh, about the amazing cusp of transformation that we uh, are either privileged or cursed to live with him. Uh, and, you know, we, we hear talk about uh, the power of uh, a global information system falling into the palm of a 12 year old, uh, the exhaustion of the entire energy infrastructure that sustains modern civilization, the collapse of ecosystems. The, uh, the rising level of, of intelligence and awareness afforded through I information technology. Uh, the amazing ability to extend our lives, our lifespans. But to me, the social transformation of social transformation is the one that is still not discussable in polite conversation. And it has to do with the extraterrestrial and the other question. It's, it's fundamental for this reason. If you look back on the history of life on Earth, in the, in the biggest sweep possible, there are some really profound cusps. And they tend to happen when creatures move from one phase of matter to another. We're in the polyp at the base of the ocean floor gains a fifth. Or when the, the fish learns how to crawl out on the dry land. And when the, the, the animal on dry land figures out how to soar, we may be privileged to live in the time when we take flight into a, an entire new phase of existence for, for animal life. And uh, what's incredibly humbling and awe-inspiring and energizing to me is that it may happen in our lifetime when we become, possibly, the extraterrestrials for other Earths. So to me, the, the, the potential wisdom that could be gained by the study of, of, uh, that John and, and others in that field have been pioneering for years is potentially of profound importance. After all, if you're, if you're, a, if you're, if you're a reef fish and you suddenly turn around and and realize, wow, there are other coral reefs out there. It might be a good idea to listen to the people who have been reporting on the interaction with the other fish. Um, and uh, one of the reasons why I, I uh, have been honored to, to help in some small way with the, the center is that while there are a lot of people, or not a lot of people, a few people who study the, the questions of uh, interactions between human beings and, and non-human intelligence, uh, I find that John's sense of interpretive balance is the, the best developed uh, in the field. Um, the abduction literature is littered with paranoid interpretations of, of, uh, that are rather frightening uh, when I, I think that the reality of the situation really best, is best supported by the notion that there are creatures out there who are occasionally picking us up with us whales up out of the water and probing us, measuring us, doing things like that. And it could be frightening, but it can also be transformative when the whales go back into the water and start telling their, their, uh, their compatriots about the experience. So I'm, I'm honored to be able to in, uh, endorse the work of John and the center and uh, look forward to our little conversation here. I just want to say a word about uh, Joe uh, that he, wouldn't, he didn't say about himself. I. Uh, I followed very closely the uh, articles that talked about a, a young uh, man in his late twenties who had the world in his hand and was uh, involved in the most exciting internet exploration and creativity that was going on, uh, working with a two billion dollar company and then he had a visitation from another intelligence. And he not only had that visitation, but he was so foolish or courageous, depending on how you want to look at it, they kind of go together anyway, uh, to uh, talk about it and to tell his colleagues in business. And uh, what I gleaned from that was that their basic attitude of his uh, 
partners and colleagues. So, Joe, we love you. We really, really uh, believe you. We respect you, but it's not good for business. And uh, so, Joe looked at that and he said, "Well, if it's, I don't want to do any harm to the business, but I'm not going to give up on that." So he left the corporate world uh, and became, for me, an example of somebody putting principle, his higher consciousness, ahead of the business as usual kind of world that uh, most of us live in. So I just want to express that appreciation to you. Uh, the, the, issue, the issue that's in, in front of us, the three of us to start with, and then the group of us in, in, at large, is, is really, is it necessary, do we believe it's necessary to elevate the actual consciousness of our human family in order to solve these major public policy problems that are facing us? The issue of the Middle East, the, uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict, the conflict between India and Pakistan, the, uh, the East, the, the challenge of, of the rising Asian empire in the West, uh, the underdeveloped nations, the inequitable distribution of resources in the world. Do we believe that we can, just by following the kind of straight, secular, logical, political, two-party uh, parliamentary system in Western civilization, can we simply extend this to the rest of the world and have any reasonable expectation that we're going to solve this problem? Or do we believe that there is some need to really uh, amend and elevate the consciousness of our human family, or some substantial, critical uh, portion of our, of our human culture in order to solve this problem? And what role, if any, do we think that this, this issue of potential contact with extraterrestrial civilization uh, and potential technological advancements that are uh, be being developed in the context of trying to reach out into outer space or even potentially technology that is conducted to us from contact with extraterrestrial civilizations may have upon this kind of radical transformation of human consciousness. This is the question and what I'd like, what I'd like to do is just start by asking you, Joe, uh, and you and I have talked about this before, what is, what is your understanding of the potential relationship between the kind of rapid increase in technological discoveries that are being made at, at this particular juncture in our life and its potential threat for both the, the human family and the potential opening onto a new level of consciousness? What's your understanding of that? Well, it's enough to spend several lifetimes trying to figure out for sure. Uh, but my, my intuition and, and common sense says that technology is exclusively a force multiplier. Uh, and it will multiply whatever force is, uh, is applied. Um, as we can see from the week in review from the New York Times, it's kind of horrifying when you realize just how uh, amoral the instruments we've created are. Um, I but therefore believe that, uh, that uh, a transformation of consciousness is an absolute requirement for a uh, significant paradigm change for society. It, 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 can't, it can't happen any other way. The, the, the trajectory of the second millennium society has created a, uh, a, a chrysalis in which we are hopefully uh, in some stage of being able to break through. But uh, what we'll look like on the other side of that, I think, will be quite different. Um, I do, however, believe that it's possible for there to be punctuated events in that process, uh, some of which can be actually catalyzed by the tools of our own uh, creation, uh, technological uh, tools. Uh, the internet is a spectacular example of one such possibility. We now have, in principle, the ability to create an electronic mirror for human beings to see uh, the reflection of the, the consciousness of the entire species. In 1968, we saw the beginning of what that might mean when the cover of Life magazine, I think in 
the October issue or, or whatever, the human family saw their mother from the outside for the first time. That's really profound. And when you think what the internet might be able to do to offer the ability to explore that with orders of magnitude more uh, fidelity, uh, I think uh, I think that there could be a punctuation in the next several decades in the consciousness uh, uh, of, of humanity. I'm certainly hoping for that. And John may have something to do with helping catalyze that. <laughs> um, should we open it up? Maybe yeah, just to start with. Um, well, one of uh, you know, we, we had marching orders here from Don, and uh, I'm not. I, I'm not doing. I'm not following the orders too well, but uh, I never do. So that's uh, 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 one of the um, questions here uh, that uh, we pose to ourselves, really, and to you is: there's a, there, there's a kind of a dichotomy in the transformational community, or in the uh, uh, people who work to around the awakening uh, of consciousness, a dichotomy between individual transformation, that is what we do for ourselves as individuals, and yet the question is, what does that have to do with collective change? And it's not an easy conversation. Is it, uh, there's the people that take this position, well, if we just individually change enough people, and there'll be somehow some critical mass will somehow uh, lead to uh, a, a softening of the uh, institutional forces that create uh, war or destruction of the environment. And then the others feel, well, no, there has to be some kind of more direct uh, application of that transformational understanding or spirit in into the social arena. Now, certainly part of that has to do with the communication. Now, there's providing of information so people get what that transformational process is, is all about. But there is still this uh, tension and this dichotomy. And we, we try to address this at the center. And we have people on both sides of it. I, I believe it's a false dichotomy, but it's still not uh, so easy to uh, be clear about how you take transformation at the personal, individual level and then bring it uh, into effective uh, political, social policy change, as, as Danny was saying, is so uh, essential. I'm sorry, uh, what's the dichotomy? The dichotomy between, the between uh, the processes of individual consciousness change and transformation and social and political change. Okay. That, uh, my, my own personal opinion uh, on this is that uh, I believe that this motive of self-interest that we have, this survival instinct that each one of us has, and the desire to compete and to achieve uh, is, a, is, a, is a very positive, constructive uh, aspect of our human nature. The difficulty with it is, is that this motive for survival and assertion and competition uh, can cause us to uh, alienate ourselves from our fellow human being. We objectify others, we vanquish them, we, we compete with them, etc. And that the, the quest is to try to figure out how is it that we can harness that energy of self-interest and drive and competition and at the same time, while harnessing it, have the individuals who display that in the highest levels at the same time begin to experience an affection, a genuine caring, a genuine compassion for our fellow human beings so that we will bring to bear the talents of the energy of self-interest uh, on behalf of a larger collective than just our own person, our own family, our own company, our own country. And the, I believe that, that one of the, the primary theses that, uh, theses that exists in the human family is that there is in fact 
access to a specific experience, a mystical experience that is normative in its nature. And when you have this experience, you then realize in some experience, intense experiential way that, that you are, in fact, part of a huge, unified, uh, living being. And you share the same basic being with everyone. And that this is the thesis of the organized and unorganized spiritual community of the human species. I believe that, that this is, is in need of great understanding on the part of our generation. And it's, it's, it's one of the most written about and talked about subjects, of course, in the human experience. But our generation has to come to grips with this to try to figure out what the mode of spiritual expression is going to be for our generation in this scientific, logical, positivist, competitive world. And I believe that, uh, that the, only the only other potential candidate for experientially overcoming this narrow drive for self-interest uh, to the point where it's unbridled, uh, that is the only other competitor with genuine mystical spiritual experience is some kind of revelatory insight, either experiential or otherwise, in the reality of the existence of other civilizations, so that we can context ourselves, and so that the, the religious experience, re legare, has to do with relinking, relinking our apparent separate self with the entire universe and our community of other beings. And so that I'm, I'm curious, for example, Joe, with you, that what is, what is your personal <coughs> opinion about the relationship between a, a kind of uh, panhenetic mystical experience and the experience that you encountered when you actually came into the presence of this being? Uh, it's a super question. And, and I'd like to answer it by generalizing one, one aspect of, of, of the answer. Um, one of the real problems that I think modern society has inherited is a, uh, an, ex, an excessive uh, mutual uh, rejection of science and spirituality. Um, the 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 notion that the mystical experience, as it's termed, uh, is in is for some reason inherently uh, incompatible with the scientific uh, worldview. I, I completely reject that hand. I, I consider that to be a deficiency of the language of science to be able to. Uh, simply the knowledge of science, to be able to quantify and, and, and describe what it is that's being, uh, that, that it is that it's occurring. Um, I'll give you a simple example of this. I mean, how many atoms are there in your body? Well, I presume several trillion or more. Do you have a mental picture that you would, or anybody would presume to, to call accurate of what an atom looks like? Um, I don't. I mean, the little orbiting thing, you know, is a really, really rough cartoon version of what it really is. It's some beautiful energetic geometry. We don't have a mental picture of it. That doesn't make it not real. And so the notion that the, the synchrony uh, uh, of atoms spread between living beings, all, by the way, made of the same underlying force. Uh, having coherent patterns that resonate uh, not only between individuals of a species, but the resonant patterns that emerge as species begin to intermingle, 
I think is an incredibly rich field of scientific uh, exploration. Uh, and one of the consistently reported themes that John has surfaced, and many others have as well, is the notion that one aspect of that convergence or interaction uh, among beings is that, you know what? There are modes of sensing and communications that uh, we don't get yet. We do not comprehend. It does not make them anti-scientific. It doesn't make them some woo-woo, new age, unfathomable uh, psychobabble. It simply makes them, t to me, the object of exploration, both subjectively, first person, and objectively. And I think it's the science of the third millennium to figure out what the consciousness dimensions are of the kind of experience that I have, because I have absolutely no clue. <laughs> well, let, let me re-put that part yeah. of the question. Yeah. How, how, do you, how do you personally relate uh, what you understand to be kind of a mystical religious experience to the special nature of the encounter that you had with this being? Did you view that as a religious experience or something analogous to it, or how was it for you? Uh, uh, first of all, I really don't know what it was. Uh, I wake up one morning and, uh, you know, a being appears to be hovering over my bed and, and uh, we have a conversation and an energy, sphere of energy, this electric blue sphere comes from him into me and it was an, an absolutely ecstatic uh, biological feeling that I had. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to classify it as a so-called religious experience as opposed to a scientific experience or any other. It was a human experience. And uh, I, I'm rather convinced uh, from my study of physics, and certainly by the empirical data from first-person testimony throughout the millennia, that non-local forms of communication can occur. After all, if atoms can do it, why can't constellations of atoms? Um, and so the experience could have been some kind of rejection of consciousness from another being. It could have been a biological being there. Or it could have been a bad potato. <laughs> uh, but it certainly had a very profound impact on, on, my, uh, on my life. So <laughs> I rather suspect it was something more than a bad potato. <laughs> but I can't be sure. John, what's, what's your sense of that? What is, what is your, I, I was most amazed when I, when I first read your book uh, about the, the fact that you seem to cross over barriers that had previously existed with the extraterrestrial phenomenon. You started d moving into realms that seem to be realms of the spirit, that they seem to have to do with uh, not only uh, kind of a, a religious experience that people started to have in a, but it had a normative, it carried a normative dimension with these encounters with these beings, that they, the, the experiencers began to have a much different attitude about their fellow human beings and about their, uh, the environment and other things. How do you relate the, the experience of extraterrestrial phenomena with what has historically been referred to as a religious phenomenon in the human family? Uh, I'll best answer that with a, a story. Um, at this uh, multidisciplinary conference, uh, there was a very well-known Harvard historian of science, um, a young woman actually, a uh, brilliant woman, and uh, each of the subgroups we had, there were breakout groups, and there were two experiencers in, uh, assigned to each of the breakout groups. And so then the uh, a chairperson was appointed from each of four breakout groups to report on their, um, what they'd found. Now, one of the breakout groups was about the light and energy phenomena connected with the abduction, so-called abduction experiences. And uh, this uh, professor of history of science was the chairperson to report on the group's process. And she, uh, one thing she'd said earlier, which was, I thought, you know, right on. She said to me, turned to me frustrated because she couldn't explain this whole thing away. And she said, John, this is a wily reality. And uh, I thought that is very true. Uh, but what she said was, uh, well, you know, it's a funny thing what happened in our group. Uh, we talk about light and energy and experience. And then we find we were really talking about God. And that is, 
says it as well as I can. In other words, if you begin to look at these encounters, which look very kind of, you know, material, three-dimensional beings are here, you know, like in Mel Brooks' 2000 Year Life, oh, there's aliens here, you know, I mean, the, there is a, some, uh, it's very concrete, it's very physical, uh, you can touch them, they're there. Uh, at the same time, what happens to these individuals when you go deeply into what's occurred, I mean, like Joe was referring to, something happens if you go through the terror, they uh, transform. They become, as Danny said, very concerned about the earth, related to the earth, and in a, in a very different way, relating to other human beings in, in a very different way. So what, for me, started out as, you know, arguments trying to prove there really are abductions, really true, it's really aliens here, and that, you know, that's what Harvard got after me about. That isn't any longer what was interesting to me. What was interesting to me, yes, it's real, and we can have a philosophical discussion on the ontological status of the phenomenon, sure. But what was more profound was those encounters led to a opening of consciousness to what has been called mystical or primary religious experience or expanded consciousness. We all have our language for, for this. So it seemed like there was this linkage, but the the the, the, the Central point is knowing. How do we know? What are our ways of knowing? How do we use our intuition, our whole selves, uh, holistic knowing, knowing from the heart? That dimension of knowing, which is traditional knowing in almost every culture on the world, in the world, the sacred act of knowing. If you uh, uh, read some of the philosophers uh, uh, like uh, Syed Nasser, who's uh, written about this, uh, uh, that sacred knowing has been lost in this culture. So. If you, science, it's not that science isn't a sacred way of knowing, but it's a way of knowing that relies very much on a separation from what is being studied from the self that is doing the study. It's not an entering, a, a co-creative, transformative act, a sacred act of, of knowing through the whole being. That's not thought to be scientific. That's religious. Well, uh, maybe the common ground is, what is, what is, how do we think about knowing? And that's where I think they come together. I, I have a, a simple phrase that there's someone here who's been trying to oh, yeah. conversation. Yeah, I want to remind you that that was one of the intentions. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, let's well, stop, let's, here. let's stop yeah, us. Yeah, no. absolutely. Uh, come on, we, we could go off yeah, forever up here. Uh, yeah, please. Yeah, please. Um, the thing that I'm baffled with, and I'm not a I agree with what John Max uh, originally put out, you know, the individual has a conscious change and then we want to bring it to the collective. And then you brought up some things about uh, the horrible things that are going on in the world. And I want to know how you gentlemen uh, propose to change the governmental attitudes that tend to promote those destructive things and prevent us from getting to what John Mack wants to do. I have had an experience, uh, I don't know about uh, Joe's, and I know that it's changed me. But uh, everybody I know that I want to talk to about it, they think sometimes I'm a little bit off my rocker, uh, especially uh, when it comes to mentioning the, the idea of aliens. So the question of trying to convert mass group of people to this objective, I think, is a long-term effort. And I'd like to have a short-term effort where you can move in and trying to change what some of the governments are doing. Because those destructive forces that you mentioned, we're contributing to them. Our industries are making the things they're using. Danny, you want to speak? Let me say yeah, one thing. Danny has a much better answer to this, but uh, my answer will help tee him up. Um, it wasn't actually my visitation experience, if that's what it was, that convinced me that uh, there, there's an underlying reality to this phenomenon. Uh, I studied physics in the, in the late 80s and left it when I realized they didn't pay physicists very well, uh, unless you wanted to make bombs. And uh, I rejected the UFO phenomena back then, and I studied it carefully. Uh, and I rejected it for one reason, uh, that the prevailing theoretical apparatus says that fashion and light travel is not possible. And uh, eight years later, I came to realize that that is patently 
false. That is simply uh, a, a, a naive reading of, of the theories of, uh, of, our, of gravity uh, extrapolated in very uh, uh, weak and unjustifiable ways. Uh, and uh, because of that study and my position in Silicon Valley, I had the opportunity in 1997 to meet with very senior people in, in the military and in intelligence organizations later uh, that absolutely convinced me that we are dealing with a, a tangible phenomenon. Uh, and uh, Danny uh, is among some of the heroes who've tried to penetrate the shield of information protection around that. So. Yeah, this is a this is a you know, extraordinarily important question here about the how do we how do we deal uh, as as a human family with elements of our human family who seem to be self consciously organized to attempt to encourage and establish structures uh, that facilitate and stimulate warfare. Uh, and it seems to me that, and this, this is a very, very difficult answer, but it seems to me that we need to develop a, a political movement that consciously talks about the issue of consciousness and articulates very clear principles that flow from an elevated state of consciousness and what policies would flow from this elevated state of consciousness and translate this into concrete programs that are financially practical, that are realistic, that are concrete and that we need to generate a public policy movement in the affirmative behind these concrete policy programs. Uh, uh, and we need to do so in a way that makes the, the medium the message so that we do not uh, attack and vilify uh, people like George Bush Jr. and George Bush Sr. and uh, you know, even Richard Armitage. Uh, or these other people, or even Richard Pearl, for that matter, in, in the administration, that we come to an understanding that, that these individual human beings are functioning out of a different worldview. And that what we need to do is we need to put into the public dialogue a, a public policy movement that comes from an alternative worldview, a different worldview. And that's what we need to do. And it, 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 but until we, until we can articulate this and articulate what the principles are and the policies are and the programs are and move into raising up candidates that are going to advocate this across the political uh, landscape of our country, then in fact the other people are going to prevail. And we can, we can try to raise consciousness I think as much as we want. But we need, as a generation, as three different generations coming together, to exercise the responsibility of taking responsibility to govern in the name of these principles and these policies by, by articulating concrete programs that master this fundamental underlying question of how we can harness self-interest to serve not only the interests of our, ourselves as individuals and our families, but also the interests of the community at large, not only the nation state, but the whole world. And that's really what we need to do, instead of setting up a dialectic and antagonizing uh, the people in positions of power. Yeah, I think that leads right into the, how are we going to do this? Um, you choose. There's, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I just. Uh, you got to speak up, because I don't think there are mics all, all around. Um, Try to project. Um, we've just finished a uh, half million dollar research study of American attitudes and consciousness, values, and beliefs with this in mind because it's vital. We need to have whatever occurs in terms of our external circumstances, if 
we are not able to bring our own attention as individuals and a collective species into what really brings us together or what is our connected uh, aspects of our greater being, then there can never be that. There's an interplay. On one hand, people do need to have leaders to, in effect, act as, as a whole. And that's very important. And at the same time, we have to have individuals uh, recognizing and honoring uh, this amongst themselves at all different levels. And so uh, I would just like to echo that. It's, it's, it's definitely going to require substantial resources to do this. And to do one without the other would be unfortunate. It would set up a new priority and uh, it would not move ahead. So I just want to say I agree with both and we're in the process of sharing this material. Don, Don that be, would you comment on the work we're doing with Mark Gerzon? Because I think it relates to the leadership question uh, precisely that the uh, gentleman raised. Um, uh, Mark Gerzon is one of the uh, people that uh, worked early on with the Center for Psychology and Social Change. Um, he has uh, facilitated the, the, uh, a, 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 a sort of a summit between the USSR, when there was a USSR, and uh, Hollywood. So he represents a, um, a mediator uh, that has demonstrated some extraordinary efficacy in creating a conversation between a dialogue between two organizations. Um, to, one of the things that Mark realized that he shared with us recently when we were just in Colorado uh, last week was he had an epiphany that uh, it was clear that to him that what there wasn't in, in our society, in particularly, let's just talk about the United States, was a leadership that had a conscious leadership, that had the leadership of principles. There's no stand. There's a leadership of interests. There's no one who takes a stand based on the principles that they, you know, have in their hearts and are willing to stand up against that no matter what befalls them, what's thrown at them. People instead, you know, take the leadership of, of, of interest. And what Mark is a, in, in, uh, would like to do through the center, uh, with because of our relationship with Harvard University through Cambridge Hospital. It create you know one of the great dynamics that the center offers that is just, it seems important to particularly to this conversation is how does one get momentum to make social change you know and, and through the institutions of higher learning like like Harvard there's a vehicle to create a, a, you know some credibility to to this issue of leadership consciousness or you know certainly to they I, I have to tell you that I have to speak uh, frankly that they're very shy about the UFO issue that, that was a joke okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll tell you what to laugh um, but so Mark has done some extraordinary work and that's the type of work that, 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 that the center would really like to bring forward in terms of individual transformation because it, it, the the center is a, is a, is a commitment to both individual as well as, as social transformation. And part of what we're trying to do is create a vehicle to, to a, a, a variety of vehicles to help uh, facilitate that in a, in a quicker fashion. I just want to say, uh, right as we speak, Mark is working in Washington with a meeting of Republican and Democratic chiefs of staff around some of these concepts that we're sure. talking about. In other words, it's the collaboration, and he has led, uh, he's facilitated retreats of the Congress. In other words, so there are in our network that uh, people, not only, not all, these programs don't come, aren't, the center isn't doing these things as a center. There are many things we are doing as a center, but we also work in collaboration with people who are trying to transform at that policy leadership level. So uh, I think this is just a, a very good example of the kind of umbrella, what we include within this umbrella organization. Yeah, let's get some more people, Boy, a lot of hands. Yeah, go ahead. Let's try to, if you can be, you be brief and we'll be brief. That's what's even more important. Um, yeah. The question I have is we're talking about societal individual changes. My experience is that when I've transformed inside, then my world does transform. But my question, though, particularly for your research, is that I find that's a very tough process. And the individual has to walk through the fire 
And what I observe is that pe many people who started, but when they be when the fire gets too hot, people pull back. All right, and rather than looking at it as a spiritual crisis, people will go on Zoloft or whatever. <laughs> I really see that happening in this country. You know, rather than really taking the opportunity and fully walking through it. So my question for you is, as you're doing your research, is that, you know, my sense is that it seems easier for people to transform over the last 10 years. There's something lightening up. But I'm not sure whether that's really true. Because I think that's what it requires. It's just too hard for the, the, the average person. Can you hear, did you hear this? Very important. Uh, I want to make sure that you're hearing uh, everything that's getting said from the audience. I think one of the primary uh, objectives of the center is to be a support for people who are undergoing individual transformative change or transfer that, that are opening up in their own lives, that are going through these kind of crises, but then create a context in which they, their voice can be heard. In other words, they have the courage to move beyond their own personal private transformation and can gain legitimacy in the culture of bringing that personal experience into a larger context. So we do a lot of that kind of work just to uh, find people who, not just the UFO abduction thing, but many people are going through, as you say, transformative experiences of all kinds, but they keep them private. Like we have an institute uh, for, uh, in the hospital for a clinical place that people can come when they're having spiritual transformative experiences and aren't going to get diagnosed and put on Zoloft. You know, exactly that is what you're saying. Yeah. So uh, is what we're trying to do is legitimize not only are these normal experiences, but they're experiences that have something to say to the larger culture if the people can be legitimized and if we can create a context in the society where there is an acceptance of the importance and the power of such experiences so that people are not pathologized. And my profession, the psychiatric profession, is in some ways, at you know, a big way, at fault for not playing the role it should be playing, but rather falling into this kind of, I don't know, drugging corporate thing of people's powerful opening up of heart time kind of experiences. Instead of being there with people and saying, yes, this is part of the movement of awakening, oh, that's hallucinations, or oh, that uh, you have spirits? Oh, well, take this and the spirits will go away, you know? And uh, uh, in fact, I was, a, I, a, just a little, another little story. I, I did a rounds at the emergency ward at the hospital. One of the psychiatric residents uh, presented a, a, a man who was having spirits visiting him. And uh, she's, you know, he's troubled by it, but probably more, tr more troubled about how the people around him were receiving this communication that he was having these relationships with the spirits. So she said, well, you know, I can help you. I can put you on medicine and you won't have, you know, the, the, those voices, those spirits will quiet, quiet down. And he said, he refused that. I don't want that. I'm not here to have those spirits go away. I'm here to develop a more creative relationship with those spirits, to accept that relationship. So in other words, that's just a small example of what we try to do in legitimizing that this a much greater range of human experiences uh, instead of you know marginalizing them or labeling them. Let me, let me ask. Let me ask. There's so one, many people. Yes, let me ask one quick question to, to Joe, if I could, on this: is that what is what is your understanding, personal understanding, of the relationship based on everything you've read and everything else, which is considerable now? What is your understanding of the relationship between extraterrestrial beings in their manifest forms and this spirit realm of beings that allegedly exist in this spiritual realm and visit people and uh, you know angels and all of that and I know out of your own religious tradition that there's a very very rich uh, tapestry of those kind of stories what is what is what is your personal level of thinking about that at this time uh, <coughs> Tough question. Uh, I would I would first of all say that uh, I do think that the, the, the bio, at a biological level the phenomena exists, and uh, I think stepping up from that that there are capabilities of consciousness that advanced forms of life likely possess 
that uh, may be staggeringly astonishing to us to communicate without vocalization, for example, to communicate perhaps in some kind of electromagnetic uh, 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 pattern of resonance in, in physical systems. Um, I rather suspect that a good percentage or a good portion of the historical literature that has to do with you know, the folklore uh, uh, and the sort of uh, more ruggedly physical reports of angelic visitation have to do with the, the same phenomena that we're dealing with in UFOs. Uh, simply different words applied from the lexicon. And, and lastly, uh, I gotta talk about I do think that resources. We gotta get out. Uh, I'll start then. When a human brain experiences an energetic impulse, the the human being will will will, uh, I think, quite reasonably interpret that with a mental picture that is comprised of symbols that are uh, that are previously known, or at least constructible out of the symbols in one's mind. So I'm not sure how to interpret the the experiences of things more etheric than than physical bodies. Um, I think it is a is it is it's an open question as to whether it's appropriate to anthropomorphize uh, a, a, an an energy form simply because we have a mental picture that's using that symbol. Um, but it is an open question, and I think it's again an example of the third millennium science. That hopefully becomes legitimized someday. You know, I, I want this conversation to continue, but I just want to mention one thing, because this is kind of the, one of the harder parts of this, is the center needs support. I mean, this is one of the objectives here, is to uh, share with you what we're trying to do, and also to ask for your help and for your support. And I want to just take a few minutes out for that, and then we'll continue the, the discussion. But I, I, I want to bring that here because I think we can lose sight of the fact that this kind of work can't go on without some uh, resor further resources than, than we uh, are available just now. So Don, do you just want to say a couple words about this and then we can continue the, the discussion? Uh, um. And others here can speak to that too. Danny, I sure can. Um, you caught me off guard. <laughs> Um, I warned you. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> I just tapped Danny and said, you know, give me, you got 10 more minutes, and then I'd like to say something about the center. Um, let me get grounded here a little bit. Don, let me speak while you're. Uh, yeah. You don't have to do no. all this. No, 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 I, about the fundraising issue, okay, believe me. <laughs> Listen, uh, I had the honor of, of making a six-figure contribution to this group when I was wealthy. And uh, I've subsequently spent uh, all my remaining resources to try to build, uh, help build a system that, that can tap the, the latent capabilities of the Internet to provide a learning environment that's based upon the best science known with uh, an open mind to what the future may have. But to use the system to try to, to uh, empower thousands of organizations around the world in civil society and NGOs and science research institutions to collaborate as co-creators of a nonprofit AOL, if you will, but focused on education rather than selling stuff. And one of the intersection points uh, thus for me in my life and this project with the center is to organize a community of conscious consciousness research organization to take stewardship of the realms within that in internet information system that have to do with consciousness and and the attended phenomena that we've been discussing the center is one of those organizations that uh, deserves and needs to be equipped to provide the, the, the raw research, to continue the empirical work, to continue to interact with first-person uh, experiencers, and to continue to sponsor scientific research uh, to afford that kind of uh, 
uh, educational platform. And so I would issue a strong uh, request and endorsement of any help that can be supplied by this network of people to, uh, to advance the vision that John Mack started long ago and help, uh, help it uh, flourish. I think it's, it's going to be front and center when we face prime time for, uh, for the coming social change. So I, I hope the center will be ready for that, for that point. Um, I, I want to tell you a little bit about my own passion for this. And I, th I think that might be a good start for me to uh, be more available to um, my commitment and for you to get that. that uh, uh, a little bit of a sad story with a really happy ending, and that it's it. You know, I, I grew up in a in, in a, a, a section of Boston called called Southie, and I it was, you know, I was bright blue collar. I didn't understand. Uh, it seemed to me that uh, we had less than most of the kids I went to school with. My father was a drunk. Uh, he was violent with uh, both my brother and, and and my mother and me. And we were subjected to tortures to, to the degree that when I was 11 years old, I stood outside his bedroom with a, a, uh, a kitchen knife, and I was trying to get the courage to plunge it into his chest. By the time I was 22 years old, I had a, a felony on my record. I spent six months in jail. During, you know, shortly after that time, I met a fellow named Robbie Gass, and I met a, a number of other people in my life that... Uh, that led me on a, somehow saw something in me that I didn't see, because I was a pretty angry guy. I was the guy that he wanted in jail. But then he saw something in me and he encouraged me to, uh, to uh, participate with him. I met Ron Das, I spent a couple of weeks with him and with um, uh, Stephen Levine, and then he introduced me, he brought me to uh, meet uh, Baba Muktananda, who, uh, he, he was hitting everybody else with peacock feathers. He punched me in the chest and knocked me down. I didn't quite understand what that, what that, what that might mean, uh, but maybe that was the kind of uh, shock I, I required. Uh, other people need a little bit lighter touch. Um, I strained my life out. Uh, I, I actually, I spent three weeks at a, uh, at a Buddhist monastery, and in the third week I had a spiritual experience that irrevocably changed my life. And I, you know, most of my friends that I grew up with are dead or in jail. And somehow my life was altered in a course of events in such a way that, you know, I changed dramatically. And uh, I didn't know, I didn't drink up until that time because my father was an alcoholic and I was going to turn out like that. But 35 years old, I, I've now been working with the Digital Equipment Corporation for nine years and um, I was the data manager for Digital Equipment Corporation. I traveled around the world, spoke about data management. I helped to facilitate the EDI standards, as commonly known as the barcoding that you use in a grocery store. They were developed by my organization. So I had really changed my life quite a bit. But I didn't know I was going to become a drunk. And in five, it, I became a, once I picked up that drink, it, within five years, I, I lost liquid assets of $750,000. And I was homeless. Now, so eight years ago, I was carrying them on my, my home in a green garbage bag at Pine Street in Boston. Now, I, uh, it, after 30 detoxes, you know, I once again recalled that I had a very different life of spirituality. And I sought somebody out who was a mentor, and I asked him to help me. And we get down, you know, and I went through a process and asked God for help. Now, I don't know, you can't tell me that these other ways of knowing aren't real, that they're not significant in people's lives. Because after 30 detoxes, you're carrying your stuff around a green garbage bag, you get pretty clear that, that, that there's no reason for like your life to change. But I got down on my knees and I asked the power greater than myself for help, and, I, and I, that desire to drink and drug was taken away. And you can't tell me that there's not, why would that be taken away? Taken away, removed completely. See, so when I came to the, when I, then I, I proceeded to, you know, do what the, the uh, 12-step processes and to help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety and to reach out and do service work. But it seemed to me as I looked around the planet that, you know, and I grew spiritually and continued my work in Buddhism and, and, some, and, and my own spiritual development, that there was, that there was a, you know, an incredible denial that I could see in everyone around me. You know, that was, the, that, that, you know, alcoholics who were in recovery were gifted to know and to have a, a spiritual path. But there were other ways of knowing that, pe that people couldn't really 
grasp that, you know, I, I couldn't understand how they, the, the, some of these conflicts could exist. So when I began to understand, let me can I have a glass of uh, water or something? <laughs> Give me that cough. That's all right. I got it. Thank you. That was challenging for me. Um, so when I had the opportunity, you know, I started a business and I, and I left that uh, a year and a half ago because I saw the opportunity to work at the center and I, and I thought it was uh, just an extraordinary opportunity to contribute in a way that, that, that was uh, really big. And uh, I don't know, it, I, I just, I feel privileged to be in this position. You know, I'm a very linear thinker. I'm very grounded in my approach. And I, when I came to the center, it was kind of like herding cats. Uh, it, was, it was really a challenge. You know, since then we've developed a business plan. We have an institute for psychological and spiritual development that's in relationship to, to Cambridge Hospital. And it's really trying to expand uh, John Mack's work. I mean, he's 72 years old. Let's get a grip here. You know, it, it's like, how do you train people to do this kind of exploration with, around consciousness? Not just, you know, aliens, but, you know, near-death experiences. Those are all real. My experience was real. You can't tell me it wasn't. How do you understand that? You know, you know well, you can go to AA, but you've got to be able to create another model here for the rest of the planet. We've got to explore this. That's what the work of the center is about. So there's an opportunity to extend this training beyond Dr. Mack to other doctors at the hospital who are interested in this. You know, when I first came here, all I heard was the hospital really wasn't interested in this. Well, I kind of walked in with my Colombo attitude and said, what's the problem here? And at this point, they want to do, they are ready to cooperate on a, a taxonomy of anomalous experience, ranging from UFO to uh, near death, and then, to begin, and then to do an epidemiological study, trying to understand under what categories, how many people, you know, remember the, uh, the Eisenberg study of like, you know, of, um, of new, you know, of new medicine, basically, of integral medicine, and basically, yeah, that changed how corporations and hospitals began to treat people. That's what really what brought acupuncture and chiropractic medicine to being, well, I said that we can do that with energy medicine, with anomalous experience. You've got to show that the rest, of, you know, the institutions of the world are way behind us. 48% of the population has had an inexplicable spiritual experience. See, they're ready, the institute, we're ready to like have this be in the mainstream. But the center really needs help to do that. I need a, you know, an institute director, because I'm certainly not a clinical director. You know, I need, I need to have you know, the seed funding so I can, when I can walk into Templeton or walk into the Fenster or walk into Lilly, I can say, I have some of the funding for this grant. I need you to give me the rest of it. I need to have that kind of participation from people. So if it's not you but you know somebody, then grab one of those things in the back of the room and share it with somebody. Put them in touch with me. If you, I'm here for two days. If you want to talk to me, I'd love to talk to you. These are the things in the back of the room that has a donation card. I'd like you to pick it up and share it with somebody if, you, if you're not in a position to, to, to contribute. But if you are, you are the life and blood of this organization. Without you, we can't proceed. This kind of conversation is the one that needs to be vibrant and live in your life. It lives in mine. Okay. <laughs> What do you want to do? <laughs> you want to go on talking? Yeah, so, we have, yeah. so we go on with the conversation? Yes. Yeah. Quick, yeah. We'll brief, and then we'll be brief. Okay, and lots to get a lot of people in here. Do you want to do? Yes. Danny? Absolutely. Yeah. Everybody does. About what you said. His wife doesn't call me. About what you said. Do you want to go? Remember what you said? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure I do. Sure I do. So the we'll, question we'll, is, we'll repeat the question so the, the, people the, get the it. The question is, uh, the suggestion that I did about trying to figure out how to gather conscious people together and start elucidating and identifying principles uh, that would reflect public policy positions and concrete programs. 
uh, to implement and to get candidates to move out and to become advocates of these, these things. This is, this is something that could be done. In fact, I've talked to the center about it. The center is a 501c3 uh, study center that is a tax exempt center. I'd recommended that they have a 501c4, that's a section of the Internal Revenue Code, uh, a 501c4 that actually formulated policy. That, uh, that taking the principles, doing the research on the principles that would flow from these kind of numinous experiences that people have, and to articulate what those principles are, and then to translate them into public policy statements. That's all 501c3. That's all studying and education and all that. But when you get down to the line of having concrete program recommendations that take the form of legislation, they're drafted into alternative military budgets, alternative agriculture programs, alternative health programs, all of these things, you have to have that in a 501c4 form. That means that people can make a contribution to that 501c4 and they can't take a tax deduction for it. But the, the group that receives it, the 501c4, does not have to pay income tax on it. Okay, so that what needs to be set up, if this, if the, our generation needs to set up a set of centers like you're talking about, Joe, and like uh, some of the folks here on the IONS board, there are IONS people here, we need to set up a, a center where we can come together to talk about what these principles are, understanding that the implication is for public policy, that there just needs to be a consciousness here, this dichotomy that we started out talking about, about working on your own individual consciousness and trying to figure out how that translates somehow into the social sector. This is the answer to that. This is what, there, there has to be a 501c4 organization set up that can work with these, with the Center for Psychology and, and Social Change, with IONS, with other groups, that can try to elucidate what the principles are that are discerned from these preternormal experiences and then elucidate the policy, the public policy statements that would flow from that and the concrete programs that would be implemented. It's very concrete. I have a long series of uh, suggestions that, uh, that could, could be implemented on this. For example, you, you take a look at, I don't want to get too far, but you take a look every, uh, every two years in, when there's a not presidential election. In the presidential election, only about 51% of the eligible voters even vote. When you get in the off a presidential year, of the, the two years later when you're electing uh, congressmen and one-third of the Senate, less than 33% of the eligible voters in the country even vote. So what you do is you look at, since there's going to be one-third of the United States Senate, 33 senators are going to be elected on these off years. You find that those 33 states where the United States Senate is going to be elected, you find that the three or four of them where the last election six years ago one of the senators, either Republican or Democrat, was elected by only a 1 or 2 percent majority of the 33 percent of the people that voted. That meant that like 16 percent of the people, the eligible voters in the state, voted for one, and 17 percent voted for the other one. All you have to do is generate 18 percent, 18 percent of the eligible voters in that, in that state to vote for a candidate that, pro that sets forth concrete, constructive, financially practical all options, and that person can go to the United States Senate, can go to the United States Congress. And this is how the thing should be done in, in the practical. That, that may be more detail than you need, but, but it can be done. In the back of the room? Yeah, in the practical, but in the reality, we had an election that was co-opted, and that's going to happen again this year, it's going to happen again in two years, and I mean, I think in this, it's great to be in this room and in this space where people are transformed and are, have had experiences and are doing incredible things, but in the real world, the means of communication have been co-opted, and Joe, I, I mean, I heard this bright spot with your new AOL, if the internet isn't already an, inaccessible to regular people pretty soon. Um, so what, I mean, it seems to me that we need like a wedding of information and consciousness raising and policies and people. I mean, we do have people in Congress like Kucinich, but the word's not getting out. And even if it is, people are so in their own 
stuff. So well, part of this is a, is a consciousness thing among ourselves. The fact the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is that a substantial plurality of people who are engaged in personal consciousness exploration are afraid of public policy debates and do not participate in public elections. So what we've got to do is we've got to mobilize the consciousness community to, undertake, to, to have a consciousness shift. You know, we very superciliously talk about wanting everyone else to have a shift in consciousness. We've got to have a shift in consciousness that is self-consciously political, self-consciously public policy oriented. We're dealing, with, we're dealing with an administration right now that in one year, in one year from being elected, you know, has not only completely wiped out the entire uh, uh, benefits of the, of the, uh, the post-Cold War benefits of the, of the saving money on the defense thing, but they've increased the military budget, They've advocated, advocated the construction of over 250 new private nuclear power stations. You know, they've, they've uh, exacerbated the problems in the Middle East to the point where we've got people who've been working for years and years and years and years to try to live together to help the state of Israel survive, now jeopardizing the state of Israel and jeopardizing everyone. I mean, what does it take for us to recognize the fact that this is unacceptable? And the Democratic Party is not going to offer any kind of substantial options unless Kucinich runs. You know? So we've got to be conscious about the political options here and, and set up some kind of an organization that can discern out of all of the consciousness studies that are going on what the principles are that we stand for and what the public policy implications of those principles are and how to translate this into concrete practical programs that we can tender to people in concrete political elections with concrete political candidates. It's not that that takes brain surgery intelligence to understand that. It takes a shift in our consciousness. It takes a shift in our consciousness as the consciousness community. Thank you. Thank you. So that, that sense change could happen quite rapidly once we begin moving the process forward. You've had your hand up yeah, a long time. You know, stand, lot, stand up. I've stand done up. a lot of work in research and long distance healing and non-local phenomenon are real. What I would like to suggest, your practical suggestions are great on the material plane. My belief is that the unmanifest becomes the manifest and that those of us who are doing the consciousness work can collectively do the uh, principles of non-local healing on issues as well as people. You can heal an issue, a country, a situation uh, with group consciousness. Or you can set the energy to manifest in the manifest world from the unmanifest. And I would like to encourage people to do your meditation, to join your groups, to do your group meditation with your clear intention so that the, this can manifest and support the other changes that we need on the physical realm, the policy changes and all of that. It's quarter after. It's just a quarter after. We don't want to leave. People all want right. to talk. All right. Okay. Hi, guys. Oh. Uh, let, me, let me see if I can wrap this up with a golden ball. No, we're not quite ready to wrap it up yet. No, no, <laughs> for you, <laughs> okay. For me, I'd like to just give my summary feedback loop to who you guys are and what you're doing, and, and then I have a suggestion. Uh, it seems quite obvious that we're at this, this great and glorious threshold of human civilization. I believe we're also at this historical moment in the <coughs> galaxy, too. So this is a turning point for humanity, and this is a turning point in the galaxy, according to my information. We have this rare and wonderful opportunity, the most exciting moment, perhaps, in galactic history, where we can discover who we are as a galactic species. And I believe as, a, uh, as part of galactic intelligence, you have to understand we're floating in space, so we're part of the galaxy. As part of galactic intelligence, the, 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 the part of the Earth population that we represent is the self-corrective mechanism to heal and to prove our course of evolution on this planet. 
So we can, we, there's all kinds of, and we've had many discussions on this, there's all kinds of reasons why the species is where it is now after 5,000 years of recorded history and millions of years of history that has been veiled from us. And it's all logical, and perhaps it's all even relevant and brilliant, and let's just say that the creator hasn't made any mistakes. So rather than going to a dialectic, as Danny suggests that we don't do, Let's take a look at who we are as a generation of human beings on this planet now and what our mission is. So this mission is really about doing something that the galactic historians say has never been done before. Take this body of history and turn it around through consciousness. So that's what the real opportunity is for us. It's bigger than any of us. It's bigger than all of our wealth. You know, either we do it or the experiment fails. Now, I think that would be a huge tragedy, and if we look at we flip that around and say, well, this is who we are, this is what we came to do, this is what we are going to do, that's the only, that's, that's, that's it. That's completely it. And we're here to do it. And, and look at who we are. We're all magnificent people. And we have more than enough intelligence and more than enough resource, more than enough galactic help to make this happen. So all we have to do is just focus. And what we have here is the genius in front of us, the genius of who we are, and the genius of who we know all around the planet, and the genius of who we know that we're connected with through our galactic heritage. And, and, and so I want to endorse what all of you have said and just put it in my own frame. Mac here has this respect of Harvard, you know, a whole body of... Well, I, I don't know if I have Harvard's respect for me right now. <laughs> I still respect Harvard, and I, I expect Harvard to play its role here as the, you know, the leading institution on the East Coast. We're coexisting. But let me just finish this. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll give me 60 seconds and I'll finish this. Okay, so you've got the center, and you know, you're, you're, you've got the credibility, in my mind, to be an interface with these, 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 you know, these, these people that are experiencing the leading edge of a galactic interface. Personally, I think anybody is stupid if they don't think we ought to have some of our own people out there on the, on the edge talking back to us. So for me, you're the feedback loop. I think it's fabulous, you know, and, and I'll get to what I want to do with you in a minute. Then we throw in, you know, Danny's work over here, 25 years He's ago, going to give us $100,000, that's what he's saying. <laughs> and we throw in the whole notion of public policy. Of course we need public policy. Of course we need our own public policy, which is the corrective, the self-corrective mechanism of galactic intelligence through us telling us what to do and how to correct this, 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 this historical mess that we're in. So let's marry the, the, the work of, of, the, of the center, let's throw in the public policy and Danny's whole articulation uh, on, on the new paradigm uh, and the worldview stuff, and then let's marry that with Joe's work on technology as a force multiplier and his work with the AOL internet uh, as a way to organize uh, us uh, as through these consciousness portals, which I'm very familiar with, and then there we are. We don't have to worry about it anymore, but there's one thing that's missing. Well, there's several things that are missing, but the one main thing that's missing is the economic driver and the first name again. to pay for all this. And this is the weakness of the spiritual movement and the political movement, and this is what I and others as entrepreneurs, I'm sure in this room and who we know, we can stand forward now, and we can become the true patrons and matrons of the Renaissance new age, this new galactic moment, there is galactic prophecy which is looking at Earth now, saying something that we're doing here on Earth now is, has galactic importance. I just want to ring that bell so we remember who we are. We're not just another lineal point here in a, you know, in a continuation of the normal. I mean, this is it. This is what we came here to do. This is why we love each other. This is why we gather. There's nothing else we'd rather do. So, if we can bring in the entrepreneurs, we can bring in the capital, I'm telling you, and you all know this from 9-11 from and from the dot-com crash, we need to deploy our resources while we're liquid. You can have a, a $5 billion in the bank and tomorrow can be worthless. If our mission is to do this, we need to gather our resources, and, and this is my suggestion. Let's set up an endowment fund 
for, let's pick a number, we pick a number, how about uh, $33 million? Mm -hmm. Let's pick, let's start a th $33 million endowment campaign, let's get the money to, you know, to you at your center, let's set up what Danny wants to do with his 501c4, let's funnel the money to that, let's legitimize and communicate not who we are and what we believe and what the leading explorers are telling us and create the new worldview and the alternative models and fund it. Let's fund it ourselves. There's, there's enough of us, there's 50 million cultural creatives, let's just fund it ourselves. We've got creative mechanisms to do that. I believe, I'm working on several of them. Let's fund it ourselves, let's endow this, let's set up Danny's policy, public policy deal, and let's articulate it, uh, let's use Joe's technology. And there's nothing else to do, that's it. Anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are you volunteering to chair that thirty million, thirty-three million dollar endowment uh, I'm campaign? I'm talking with you with your people. Uh, okay. Uh, all right, thanks. Once we have the money, Danny can do his work. You can do his your work. Joe can Joe can have his company funded. Joe, we're working on that also. You know, you can have your staff, and then that we don't have to discuss this anymore. We'll just get on to what's fun. <laughs> And, and, and what you're saying is, is exactly right. Chaos theory says if you can get the right impetus at the right point at the right time, you can change everything. Who wants to be the legend? Who wants to go down in history as the one that actually, you know, sees this? These are the Renaissance patrons of, of, of Italy in the, in the 14th, 15th century. You know, who wants to go down in history? It's either that or, or we're all dead. Right. Yeah. Ted, in the back, yeah, speak again. Speak up. Hi, everyone. Um, I mentioned earlier I work with Dr. Richard Haynes studying anomalous aerial phenomenon and the relationships to aviation safety. Um, and I would like to point out that the work that's being done here is very important because we don't have time anymore. In about a week, my group will be meeting to brief uh, the NASA Aviation Safety Reporting System analysts to discuss UAP. They're very interested in unidentified aerial phenomena. And the fact is that this issue is moving quicker than a lot of us might think it is. We're getting a lot of cases. We have there are international organizations who study only this inter um, for governments of France, governments of Chile, several others. We have 14 affiliates of our own in, in 14 different nations as well. All of them, all of their aviation systems are reporting the same issues. The pilots are reporting the same issues. We have cases up to and including I guess what you would call an aerial abduction. I, I, how do you categorize that? You know, I mean, but, so, so the point being is that the, the paradigm is shifting, and we need leadership in it, and it needs to take place fairly quickly. Uh, whatever it is that's going on with the UFO phenomenon, it isn't static. It's transitional. Something's happening, and whatever's going on now is not going to continue to be what's happening. We don't have time. We're already behind on this. Uh, the, the shock that this is going to create through the paradigm, I deal with underreporting bias with pilots. And I can tell you that for every one pilot that tells us this, there's, there's a good number who don't. And that is shifting slowly. Uh, but without the work that these guys are offering, this, this, it, it's going to be chaos. It's going to be extremely difficult. And did you say you were working with NASA on this? Yes, we're meeting with NASA. NASA. It's, it's a very new situation. And like it's a development within the last month. So if I could just add a, sm a small endorsement to what you're saying from one slightly different point of view. One of the reasons why I, I am proud to be associated with John here is that when the dam bursts on the UFO question, and it will, one of the most profound questions in history is who is going to be framing the human reaction to that. Uh, I, I'm horrified to imagine it being framed as uh, Hollywood does. Uh, you know, we are about to be treated with the second version of the humans defeat, you know, invading aliens uh, message, uh, you know. Uh, and I just, I, I really think it's important for the, the social visionaries and the scientific visionaries uh, who have the most rugged sense of reality and, and a rooted system of ethics at a cosmic level to uh, be active at this time and get the organizations that are capable of dealing with this credibly once the man breaks. 
Uh, you've had your hand up for it. Either one of the you two sitting next to each other. Either you decide. Okay. I wanted to, to just, uh, when I face something as overwhelmingly uh, uh, problematical and uh, hopeless looking as the human condition today, after I've gone around some spiral down into it a few times, I ask myself the question, why is this perfect? Now, you probably all know on a philosophical basis that it's perfect because it's the outcome of the causes and effects and causes and effects and it could have been different. If it was going to be different, it would have been. But uh, on the emotional level, you don't know that. And you don't bring it into life. So if you ask the question, why is this perfect? Why is it perfect that people are more and more disorganized and hurtable? Why can the American public supposedly the heartland of, of individuality and, uh, and uh, uh, democracy turn into a land in which people are herded? All you do is you, you, you tell them, hey, you're in danger, and they all say, yeah, yeah, go ahead, do anything you want to do. Uh, something has changed. It's supposing that was perfect. That's the question I feel that you need to ask, which doesn't mean you're going to get an answer, but you're going to escape from the old thinking. I can't imagine that the way to the new world is to go back into what Danny is suggesting, go back into fiddling around with the political scene and making it better. Now, I, I doesn't mean I'm right about it, but I'd like to open up a space to say democracy had its day on the earth, all things that have beginnings have ends. <laughs> Maybe there's something else emerging out of which all that we've said here finds its place to really dramatically change the world, not through electing somebody and getting another commission and, and all that. Not, I, not like I'd be stupid enough to think I know the answer, but I, asking you rather to ask yourself the question, <coughs> if this is perfect, what next? Where do we, what is it pointing to? What is it telling me? I'd like to, I'd like to respond to that. That my, my opinion is that there are substantial, there's substantially greater value in many of the belief systems of Western civilization than many people realize. And this is one of them. This, this issue, this kind of uh, uh, oriental vision that everything is perfect, uh, could also include the elimination of the human species. It may well be perfectly OK. That there's no doubt that, that uh, our Western view places uh, an extremely high value on human life. And the key is to get it extended to all human life, not just our own individual human life. And that out of the Hebrew tradition uh, and in the Christian tradition of Western civilization, there is this absolute valuing not only of the individual human being, but the absolute valuing of our species. People want to stay on it, we can stay And the entire discussion that's going on here tonight, having to do with reaching out to extraterrestrial intelligence center, has to do with the place of our species in the future of the universe. And I believe that if we can show that we are capable of self-consciously redirecting our extraordinarily aggressive self-survival mechanisms into expanding out to protect our entire human family, and at the same time not become hostile to potential uh, extraterrestrial civilization, we will have earned our place at the galactic table. I believe that what we're, we're talking about here is the, the process of our becoming what it is that we need to become collectively in order to survive. 
in order to not only survive, but in order to succeed in taking our place among the galactic civilizations. And that requires a, a recognition of some of these values in Western civilization, of the individual and individual freedom, and the importance of our human species. And that I, I believe that that's an important part of this movement. The principles that are going to be elucidated by the conscious community are going to include some, some of the values of Western civilization and some of the values of the Asian civilization, some of the values of the, the Indian uh, civilization. This is what this work is all about. Is how do we bring all of these things together through the conscious community to move them into a new paradigm, into a new vision, into a new future for our family, I believe. Uh, I think we need to wind up this part of the no, Let me evening. just say one thing. Wait, 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 there'll be some... Uh, uh, Joe's going to uh, make a short statement, and then uh, Don's going to have some wrap-up comments, and then uh, we can stay on and talk together. If if those who want to hang out, uh, I'm sure Danny can stay a while, and you can too. Uh, uh, yes, we'll, sir. And uh, we'll we'll continue in a more informal way uh, after that, Joe. Thank, thank you, John. Uh, how do you pronounce your name? Pond. Hi, Pond Greg. Okay. okay. Pondy for people who like long sleeves. <laughs> First of all, I, I do uh, hear where you're coming from. I really do. I appreciate it. Uh, I happen to agree with many aspects of it. I, I, but I also uh, believe that uh, it, it isn't democracy that's failed. Uh, it's neoliberal capitalism and that has invaded democracy. And I think that is the lesson that separating the, the two is going to be the lesson of the coming collapse, whatever form it takes. Um, and I think that ultimately what we're going to end up doing together is building a digital nation globally that is capable of affecting levels of efficiency that rip the friction out of the gears uh, and, and, and prohibit in informal ways the kind of uh, uh, viral infections of greed that uh, have destroyed the vision of the founding fathers, or at least many of the founding fathers of the country. Uh, and uh, hopefully, we can all play some role in making that, that happen.